Hey, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for In Church at Home. I hope that you're doing really well. Why don't we pray as we begin our time together? Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you that you are our source and our strength. In you, we have hope and that hope does not disappoint. Lord, today we ask for you to minister to us through this time online. We ask, Lord, that you would speak and that we would be responsive to your word. We ask for your presence to minister to us. And Lord, we have come to this moment to honour you, to lift up your name, to declare and decree there's no one else for us than you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your love and your goodness toward us. We honour you in, in, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, family, uh, thank you again so much for being with us. Uh, I really want to encourage you to be praying for the CS Basketball Tournament. It's coming up on Saturday the 28th of October and it's going to be held at the CS Leisure Centre. Our youth, with the support of Youth Alive in Victoria, are putting on this as a major outreach to young people in our local area. And we need to pray. We need to pray that young people would respond and that it would be an amazing time. Pastor Laura, our youth pastor, is also asking for adult volunteers to assist on the night. Really, it's about uh, providing some supervision, but it will be about hosting. Uh, we're putting on a barbecue uh, dinner for uh, the youth. Uh, so if you can assist, uh, just go to eNews and uh, follow the links there. And uh, we would love you to be part of the team, but you really need to do that uh, this week. The other thing that I want to encourage you to uh, set uh, a time aside for is Carols by Candlelight. Caroline Springs Community Carols by Candlelight will be held on Saturday the 9th of December. And we need everyone who calls In Church Melbourne home to be involved. There is so much to do. Uh, if you've not signed up, uh, using the volunteer link on eNews. I want to encourage you to do that today. Uh, this year, we're very excited uh, that the local Hillsong Church is going to be part of uh, helping us put this together. And we are so grateful uh, for, for that occurring. And so we just want to encourage you. This is the biggest outreach that our church does in the year. And uh, we are a missions church. We do missions all over the world, but we do missions at home. And this is missions. And so uh, we want to encourage you, if you're part of the church, uh, don't just be an attender of carols, be a part of putting it on and hosting it. Uh, we need as many people as we can. The last thing that I want to say to you is, have you been baptised? On Sunday, the 29th of October, we are holding a baptism service after uh, the Sunday service. It'll be here at uh, Pastor Melissa and my home. Uh, if you have not been baptised and want to be, again, we're asking you this week. Uh, in fact, today, would you uh, follow the links uh, to the online baptism form, indicate that you're wishing to be baptised, and uh, one of the team will be in contact with you about that. Well, uh, I just always also want to encourage you to be faithful in your giving. And uh, while uh, you're watching Church Online today, in the main uh, live service, we are having our Heart for His House offering. This weekend marks nine years since we held our first ever service at In Church. And over the years, we've had this weekend as a weekend where we take up an offering for the church. And of course, right at the moment, we are raising funds for a deposit so that we can buy a building or land for the church. We are seeking God for miracle breakthrough. Together, we've raised around 400,000, but really our deposit needs to be around the 750,000 mark. And so we're asking you to pray 
uh, to seek God. But today, if you would like to be part of our Heart for His House offering, even though you're not part of the live service, um, you can just follow the links that are there on the screen and give your offering. The other thing I just want to encourage you to be is be faithful in your tithes. Of course, tithes is above, uh, sorry, tithes is before missions. It's before our land and building fund. Uh, We give our first fruits to God first, and that's our first 10%. And so I just want to encourage you, honour God, worship God uh, with the first fruits as well. Well, last Sunday, uh, our youth pastor, Laura Ma, preached a an amazing message on the compassion of Jesus, the power of Jesus' compassion. I know that you are going to be blessed by this message, and so we're going to go to the message now. Hey, I hope to see you in one of our live services real soon. God bless. Today, uh, we're going to be unpacking two stories in the Bible, not one, two. So I hope that you came awake. Hope you had your coffee if you need that in the morning. Um, So we're going to be turning to Luke chapter 7. If you've got your Bibles or your phone Bibles with you, I encourage you to open it up. Um, We're going to be in there pretty much all of the preach today. Um, So the first story is in Luke chapter 7, verse 1 to 10. And it said, When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, he returned to Capernaum. I think that's how you say it, Capernaum. At that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does, they said, for he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them. But just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming into my home, for I am not worthy of such an honor. I'm not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the words from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And when the officer's friends returned to the house, they found that the slave was completely healed. I just find that story quite amazing. And I just think, man, that's something I would want Jesus to say about me, that I haven't seen faith like this in, any, in anyone. <laughs> um, so the Roman officer was so full of faith that he didn't, even, he didn't even go to meet Jesus himself. He didn't even need Jesus to come into his house. He knew that if Jesus just said the words from where he was, then the servant would be healed. And that's exactly what happened. And I just think that's so amazing. And his faith in Jesus like, produced such power as Jesus just from where he was standing declared healing over the servant and they were healed. And I find this story so encouraging and I find it like motivating and I'm like, wow, I want to have faith like that. So we're going to move on now to the story that's directly after that. So Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 17. Now this story has a bit of a different tone and it's kind of short and it's just kind of like a bit of a different vibe to the first one. So let's read it. It says, soon afterwards, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Whoa, that's also a pretty crazy story as well. You know, amongst these two stories are very different people, but the same Jesus. We have the Roman officer who was confident. He was a man of authority. Um, He was faith-filled. He assertively sought Jesus out. He was full of faith. He was pumped. He was motivated. And he was like confident that Jesus would heal his servant. And then we have almost like the complete opposite in the story following. We have a woman who is a widow, 
which means her husband has died. And now her only son has also died. And so I can't, can't imagine she'd be feeling very confident because, you know, she's had so much grief and loss. And in that society, if you're a widow and you don't have a husband back then, it put you at even more disadvantage. And she wasn't seeking Jesus out. She was just standing there walking next to her son's coffin. She didn't approach Jesus boldly like the officer. In fact, she didn't, I don't even know if she saw him until he came up to her. But we see Jesus still bringing life and healing in that situation. In both situations, two very different people, two very different circumstances, but the same Jesus. Despite the kind of person they were, Jesus remained the same and he was, was able to minister healing and life in both situations. Whenever I read those passages in the past, often it's that first story that really stands out to me because it's like a bit more upbeat and like inspiring and I would just, and it's kind of longer as well, so I just kind of like really hone in on that and I'd often just skip over like that short story about the widow and her son and I kind of thought like with the first story, it's like that that man, yeah, like he deserved for his servant to be healed because he was faithful, he was full of faith and he was bold. And I just kind of, yeah, like skip over the next one. But as I read it a few months ago, I, I was reading it and I just felt God want me to pause on the story of the widow and her son and to actually think about what does that mean? And, it, and it's like I could, it's almost like I could see the story. I could visualize this woman, this widow, her husband had died. She's seen a lot of grief. Life was probably quite hard for her, just having her husband died, let alone her son. And now her one son, I don't know if she had other kids, but it says her only son has died. And she's just walking next to the coffin. She's grieving, potentially lost hope. And she's just walking there, and then it's Jesus that sees her. He sees her. She's just, she's just in her grief. She's just walking next to this coffin, potentially just overcome by her grief. But Jesus is the one, and he's not even up close. He's walking like into the city, and he notices her from a distance. And he sees what has died. He sees who has died. He sees her walking next to the coffin, and he looks at her, and he has compassion for her. In that previous story, that man, he sought Jesus out. But in this story, Jesus seeks the woman out. He doesn't overlook her. You know, she's quiet. She's not all, you know, she's not all up in his face, but he still notices her. And he sees the need and he comes to her. And he brings healing and he brings life. So I'm super inspired by the Roman officer and that story, but there's just something about that second story about Jesus' compassion and the way he would notice that woman who potentially other people have overlooked. You know, she was low in society and potentially had been overlooked many times, but I just love Jesus' compassion that he would stop and he would notice her and he would go to her. He didn't, she didn't seek Jesus out. Jesus sought her out, and that's just amazing. And when I think about this story, I can't help but also think about our theme for this year, I will. And I think back to Luke chapter twenty two forty two, where Jesus is about to be handed over um, and about to give his life on the cross and die for our sins so that we can all be forgiven. And he's in the garden and he's praying to God and he's saying, God, like this is a big, this is big. You know, if there's another way, Lord, would you make it happen? But not my will, your will be done. Not what I want, God, but what you want. I will because you're asking me to do it. Jesus said, I will not to gain anything in return. He simply said, I will because God was asking him to do it. He said, I will, when the Roman officer came to him boldly, asking for healing for his servant. But he also said, I will, when he, he noticed the widow walking next to her son who had died when he saw her in the distance. And that is what we're called to as believers, to live a life where we say to God, I will because you say so. 
That is our purpose in life. If you're sitting here and you're like, why am I even here? God's calling you to say, I will do what you're calling me to do. Not to gain anything, but just because you're asking me to, because you are God. So there's, I see three key things in this passage that Jesus does that we are also called to do. If you're taking notes, the first one is Jesus sees. He saw the woman. Jesus saw the widow potentially even before she saw him. He was looking around. Not only did his, he see her at a surface level, but he also saw what was going on for her. He looked a little deeper. He didn't just look at the outside. Okay, yep, that's a, that's a woman walking. He actually saw her. He saw her grief. He saw her situation. He saw what the death of her son could, would be bringing for her. He saw the great struggle that she was in. And there's a difference between looking and really seeing. Have you ever missed something really important? Like you were right there, but you somehow just kind of missed it because you weren't paying attention. And sometimes that happens in my household. Like I'll be on my phone and my mum will be saying something important. And I'm in the room, but I miss it because I'm not quite paying attention. I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm just looking at my phone rather than at her. I'm, I'm sure we've all had moments like this where we... You know, we're there, but we're not really there. We're looking, but we're not really seeing. There's this psychological concept called selective attention. Have you heard of it? Selective attention. So it's, it's meant to be a good thing where we filter out the unimportant information and we, so that we can focus on what's important. And it's like good, but sometimes we get it a bit flipped and it's like we focus on what's unimportant and we end up missing what's important. I remember there was this one time in school and I had this friend who I knew was going through a tough time, but she, she hadn't quite opened up to me yet. And um, I remember one time we were just sitting there and I, we, lunch had just started. I, I just saw her sitting by herself and I kind of sat with her quickly. I was waiting for my friends to get their lunch. We were going to meet up. And, and I noticed she was upset and I noticed she was sad and she looked quite sad. And I just kind of said to her, I was like, oh, hey, like if you ever need a chat, let me know. Um, but then I left. I didn't even give her, give her a chance to like talk and I just left. And, and I remember God convicting me of that later, just being like, hey, Laura, like, you know, you, you noticed something was up, but you didn't really look and see that actually she was ready to talk then. And, and I missed that opportunity because I was focusing on the unimportant, you know, going to hang out with my friends, like eat a lunch, I don't know, at the Oval or whatever. Um, you know, often we miss things because we're not looking. We're there, but we're not really there. Jesus, he was ready to see. He was always ready to notice. I wonder for you, what, what in your life is pulling you away from seeing what's important? Maybe for you, it's getting really caught up in your work and in your job, that you're so busy that you, you miss things. You miss things in your family or you miss things on the street as you walk past. Maybe it's your schedule. Maybe it's what you look like, you're just caught up in that. Maybe it's your phone. I know for me that can be a big one. Phone is such a distraction. And we end up missing opportunities that God's placed right in front of us. We're, we're looking, but we're not seeing. Jesus' priority was serving God. His attention was on to what is important. His attention was on to serving the will of God. So ask yourself the question, you don't have to answer it out loud, it's a rhetorical question, but where is your attention? What do, you, what do you see each day? Are you looking? Are you just looking? Or are you seeing? Are you seeing what opportunities God's placing in front of you to make a difference? A great prayer to pray each day is, God, help me to see how you see. Simple prayer. God, help me to see how you see. Okay, second one. So Jesus saw, he sees, and then the next one is he felt. Jesus didn't just see, he didn't just leave it there, he didn't just look and notice the woman, but he actually felt. The Bible said his heart overflowed with compassion. That's like some deep feelings right there. A heart overflowing with compassion. He saw the woman and then he took the time to actually understand her situation. So often, I don't know about you, but I can get so busy that I don't take the, the time to stop and understand others kind of like that example I gave before with my friend back in school you know I kind of saw her but I didn't stop to take the time to actually understand what she was going through and what does she actually need right now you know we may see that people have a need you know that can be 
kind of easy, you know, noticing someone has a need, but the challenge can be actually not just stopping there, but taking it a little further, actually pausing to empathize with the person, to understand them, to soften your heart and to actually allow yourself to feel compassion for them. Feeling compassion can be uncomfortable. It can. Allowing yourself to actually stop and feel what others are feeling. It can be inconvenient because it takes time and potentially feeling emotions that are a bit like yucky, or like if, if that's a word, or uncomfortable. Um, and if we're not careful, we can start to harden our hearts because we don't like that uncomfortable feeling that comes when we do feel compassion. And we can start to harden our hearts and start to kind of numb ourselves to the needs or feelings of other people. And we kind of choose, actually, like, I don't really want to know what's going on. That's a bit too hard. I've got my own stuff to deal with. And so we harden our hearts. And I kind of, a good example of this is, like, if you think about a piece of clay or, like, some Play-Doh, if you leave it out uncovered out of the container or out of, no, not glad wrapped or anything, it can become, like, we all know it'll become really hard and brittle and, like, it won't be, like, moldable anymore. It'll be really hard. And it's the same with us. If we remain outside of the covering of God and the covering of His presence, if we remain outside of that, our hearts can become hard and they can, and we can start to like lack compassion. Just like if you leave clay out and don't wrap it up, it dries out. It's the same with us. When we remain outside of God's presence, we can become hard, hard-hearted. Sometimes it can be a bit of a defense mechanism. You know, we've been hurt in the past. We've tried to be soft-hearted before and it didn't go so well and so we've hardened our hearts. But, you know, we're not called to be hard-hearted. We're actually called to be soft-hearted. Sometimes the world might preach that we need to be tough and we need to, like, not show emotions there. No, that's not cool or that's embarrassing or you shouldn't do that. But actually, like, in the kingdom, Jesus, his heart overflowed with compassion. Like, that's, that's some, like I said before, that's some deep feelings. And that's what we're called to as believers, to be like Jesus Not to have a hard heart, but a soft one that's moldable and open to God speaking. There's this great verse in Ezekiel 36, 26, which says, And I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. So if you've noticed yourself becoming hard-hearted, and, it, and notice yourself, yeah, look, I, I kind of struggle to be compassionate. I just, I, I know that I've put up these walls. God can actually restore your heart back to a soft heart. That's what this verse, verse says. He'll take out your stony, hard heart and replace it with a tender, responsive heart or a soft heart. And, and the way we protect, you know, like with clay, the way you protect clay from drying out is you cover it. The same with us, the way we protect ourselves from becoming harder is being covered in God's presence, spending time in His presence. And if clay does dry out, I googled apparently if you just add water and like slowly knead it in, it goes moldable again. So I haven't tried it, but that's what Google said. Um, It's the same with you. So if you are hard-hearted, it's not too late. God can fill you with His Holy Spirit. If you allow Him to start working in your life and start asking Him, God, I want you to soften my heart, He will do it. And it will restore in you a compassionate heart. And the third thing Jesus did is he walked. He walked. I don't know if you like walking. I like a good walk. It's pretty nice. But I like that Jesus, he saw, he felt, and he walked. Seeing and feeling without acting is just sympathy. It's like, it's like a good example is like someone's down in like stuck in a hole. I don't know why, but they are. It's just the scenario. And you're up at the top and you're like, and they're like, oh, this, this sucks. Like the person in the hall, they're like, oh, this is so bad. It's so dark in here. Like I feel really lonely. And then you come along and you're like looking down like, oh, oh, I'm sorry that you fell in that hole. Like that, that must be really sad. Like I can see that. I can, I'm, I can imagine it feels really awful down there, but like, yeah, and then you just walk away. <laughs> That's like not very nice, is it? But Jesus, he didn't just go like to the hole and then just notice feel what they're feeling and walk away. He walked to the woman. He jumped down in the hole with the person or maybe give them a rope to pull them out instead of jumping in because then you both suck. Um, 
But seeing and feeling without acting, it's just sympathy. It doesn't have depth to it. It's looking down, it's feeling pity on someone, but there's no depth. I love that Jesus didn't just see, he didn't just feel, he, he acted, he walked. His ability to see others and to have compassion for them, that's actually what motivated him to walk towards the woman. It says in the story, then he walked over to the coffin and he touched it. His compassion, his sight moved him to action. You have a specific purpose on this earth. And that is to walk like Jesus walked. Every day you have the opportunity to walk like Jesus walks. To bring life where there is death. To bring hope where there is hopelessness. Light where there is darkness. You know, maybe it's not always going up to a coffin and raising someone to life. Maybe it is. But maybe it's just asking a friend, noticing a friend, seeing that, you know, they don't seem like they're doing okay and taking the time to go over them, ask them genuinely, how are you going? Like, how are you really going? Not just, hey, how are you? But like, actually asking how they're doing. Or maybe it's inviting someone to church or going out with that friend, going over to that friend at school that is a bit weird and nobody hangs out with them and like inviting them into your friend group or whatever it is for you, like, God will put opportunities in your place for you to see, for you to feel, and for you to walk and notice. Seeing, feeling, and walking. Ask God, Lord, what, what are you wanting me to see? What compassion are you wanting me to feel? And who are you wanting me to walk towards today? Jesus didn't walk away from the woman. He walked towards her. It would have been uncomfortable. Funerals are a heavy, heavy atmosphere. Like, they're not, I don't find them comfortable. They're, They're uncomfortable, they're hard, they're heavy. But that didn't put Jesus off. He walked towards the woman. And he didn't even think like, oh, but the woman hasn't come over to me, so like, I don't want to intrude. Like, he he just saw her, he saw the need, and he just went. And I just love that. And then have you ever been walking next to someone and you're like walking out of time and it just feels like really clunky? Does that happen? For me, I think because I'm tall, when I walk with my short friends, my stride is bigger than theirs, so we're just kind of like all clunky and it's just <laughs> JJ's like <laughs> putting his hands up. Um, but when you walk next to someone in the same stride, it's smooth and it's like better. Like you're not, it's not so clunky. And that's how we're called to walk with Jesus, to walk next to him, to every day to come alongside Jesus and say, Jesus, like what stride are we taking today? How fast are we walking today? Where are we walking? I want to walk with you, Jesus. That's the cool thing. Like, he doesn't ask us to go to see, to feel, and to walk by ourselves. He's right there next to us in stride, walking in time with us. So we are called to see, to feel, and to walk. Okay, so we're just going to flip that story around. Whilst we're called to be like Jesus, to see, feel, walk, sometimes we can actually find ourselves like the woman. We can, and it's like we're walking next to a coffin, not necessarily a legit one, but metaphorically speaking, walking next to a coffin. And maybe for you, some things have happened in your life and you've been struggling and you found yourself kind of like this widow and it's like something has just died in your life. And there once was hope, but now it just feels really hard and almost like hopeless and it's like you're walking yeah but it's like you're carrying this thing next to you like a coffin next to you and you have that heaviness and and maybe you're not looking at Jesus you're overcome by your circumstance and you're just like there's no hope and you're feeling that weight and you're feeling that grief maybe Jesus has been in your life before and it's like you've lost sight of him and now all you can see is that thing that's died in your life or that thing that is just weighing you down or maybe you've never had Jesus and it's just like this is just I don't know like life is just heavy and hard and that's how it's going to be maybe something has died in your life where where there once was hope where there once was passion and joy there's now dread and hopelessness and heaviness the woman in the story it's doesn't seem to indicate that she was looking for Jesus or seeking him out. It was almost like she accepted 
that her son had died. She's at his funeral. Okay, this is like what I've been dealt. This is my life now. And that's pretty fair enough, to be honest, because death is quite final, right? Like, from an outside perspective, you think, okay, like, that's pretty fair. You know, she'd lost hope. Her son had died, her husband had died, and now her only son had died. It wasn't like the Roman officer who his servant was sick, and he was still kind of had that hope, like, you know, he's, he's sick, but he can be healed. It was different. Maybe the widow had been praying like the, like the Roman officer. Maybe she had been praying like, God, would you heal my son? But now he hasn't and it's like, okay, well, I guess that's over then. Like, I guess that's it. And it could be easy to think, well, if the widow, like, if she really wanted things to change, like, shouldn't she have just gone over to Jesus? Like, shouldn't she have just, like, gone to him? But I don't know. I just get this picture of her and she, she'd been just overcome by the hardship and she was just trying to get through the funeral, and she hadn't seen Jesus yet. But I just love that that was okay for Jesus. He, he still saw her. It didn't, it didn't disqualify her from him ministering or healing her son. Even though she'd kind of given up hope, Jesus still came to bring hope. Even though there was death, Jesus was still able to come and bring life. There was still hope because Jesus was there. That's why there was hope, because he was there. To the outside eye, yes, hope was lost. Her son did die. But because Jesus was there, it didn't, the story didn't have to stop there. Life was about to be brought. Hope was about to come where there was hopelessness. Now, and I just love Jesus' heart in that. So you may be in a point in your life where you've been struggling a little bit feeling like that widow, struggling with feeling hopeless or feeling like giving up or feeling like, you know, what was the point anymore? I don't know what it is for you. You know, though, and God knows. Maybe you prayed prayers and nothing's happened and you're like, well, okay, I've done my part. Like, I don't know what else to do. I just want to say to you today, that Jesus wants to bring life where there once was death. Maybe you've lost a relationship. Maybe you've been trying to get over this battle with addiction and you've tried everything. You've tried all the different strategies and nothing seems to work and you just feel like, I may as well just settle now. Maybe it's your health issues or maybe it's mental health or like whatever it is. Or you've been trying something you know, to get good at a subject at school and you just keep failing. I just want to tell you today, Jesus can bring life. He can bring hope where there's hopelessness and where there is death. He can bring healing. Jesus sees you even when you're not looking at him. He saw the widow even when she wasn't seeing him. Jesus sees you right now, whether you're looking at him or not, whether you're like the Roman officer or whether you're more like the widow. He sees you. He has compassion for you. He's not standing there like at the top of the whole, like, judging you or, like, just like, eh, that's, that sucks, but see you later. He, he has compassion for you. His heart overflows with compassion for you. And he wants to walk towards you. He is walking towards you. And he wants to bring life into the places where there has been death. He can bring restoration. He can bring healing into the most hopeless of situations. We serve a compassionate God. And his compassion is irrelevant to what we do. Like, I know I mess up all the time, yet God still loves me. And it's the same for you. He still loves you. He still has compassion for you. And he still sees you. You might feel like nobody else sees you. Well, that's not true. God sees you. He does. Just like he saw the widow, he sees you. And so what we're going to do now as we come to a close. Um, first of all, I just want to op- offer the opportunity. If there's anyone here who realizes, like, you know, they identify with that widow and they're like, I'm not looking at Jesus at the moment. Maybe you used to, maybe you never have, but you're realizing Jesus isn't a part of my life right now and you want him to be. You want him to come and to bring life and hope into your situation. You want to accept Jesus into your life, whether it's for the first time or 
you know, you've done it before. I'd just love to offer you that opportunity. And so if that's you, I'd love to pray for you um, to accept Jesus into your life. And the cool thing is when we, when we ask Jesus into our life, the answer is always yes. He doesn't get out a book of all the things you've done wrong and think, okay, will I come into your life based on what you've done? Nah. He will say yes. When we ask God for forgiveness, when we say, God, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. Please forgive me. Please come into my life. Answer is always yes. Simple. Yes, I'll forgive you. Yes, I'll come into your life. And so we're just going to come around a time of prayer so everyone could just close their eyes and bow their heads. If that's you and you would like to accept Jesus into your life, I'd love to pray for you. And so if you could just pop your hand up just so I know who I'm praying for um, and then I'll pray. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, great. I see your hands. Anybody else? Let's wait a couple extra seconds. Yep, I see your hand. Thank you. All right, let's pray. Father God, I just thank You so much that You see us, that You have compassion for us and that You come to us, Lord. God, we just want to say we're so sorry for the things that we have done wrong, Lord, for the sins that we've committed that separate us from You. And we just want to thank You that You sent Jesus, Your only Son, to die in our place on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins, Lord. That He paid the price that we should have paid, Lord. And I thank you that he rose again. He came back to life and defeated death so that when we believe in him, we can have eternal life and we can live a life of hope. Um, God, I just pray that you would come into our life right now and we just choose from this day forward to follow you, Lord, for the rest of our lives, to look to you and to to seek to honour you and to include you in our lives. We thank you so much, God, that your answer is always yes when we ask you to come into our life. And so we just commit today to following you. In your name I pray, amen.